Okay, um, I think it's safe to begin. We have quite um, a few people here. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to your fall 2022 graduate student orientation session one. We appreciate you being here. Um, thank you for the, taking the time out of your day, evening, wherever you're uh, joining us from to make this a priority um, for you. So hello, my name is Joanne Hardy. I have been working for the David R. Cheriton School of Computer Science for six years now. You will likely see me at any of the school events that you participate in during the time with us. Uh, we acknowledge that you may have questions along the way. I ask that you please take note of them and ask them at your panel session following this general session. We do have a large group joining, so I ask that you make sure that you mute yourself and are aware of your video status throughout this session. If you would like to join muted, but would like your video on, we would be happy to see you. Um, in case of any technical difficulties, I do want you to know that this presentation is being recorded currently. Uh, the recording will be available after the webinar. I will make sure that you are aware of where you can find it. Um, and if you have any follow up or confidential questions that come up after your sessions, you can send the, an email um, to the below listed, um, I guess, emails. <laughs> so we have a general CS grad inquiries email. Uh, Denise is the CS graduate office manager, and we'll also be helping with the, some of the coursework um, sessions today or the the breakout session today nadine um, and paula will also be assisting for um thesis and phd today so as i said welcome to your computer science graduate orientation we have um professor bernard wong who is the associate professor here at the david r um, Cheriton School of Computer Science, and he is the director, our current director of graduate studies. Um, at the end of, uh, after Bernard speaks, you will have two, there's two breakout sessions available for you. One that will have Denise Schantz and Nadine Zinger, um, who will be taking care of the master's um, programs. And then we have Paula Roser, who will be uh, assisting you with your PhD. Um, session. So thank you. Welcome. And I am going to pass this over to Bernard Wong, our director. Thank you. Enjoy. Great. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. Okay, yes, we great. can. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Let me try to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, give me one second. All right. And uh, can everyone see my screen okay? I am assuming yes, thank you. the answer yes. is yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, let me just try to click on that button. Okay, great. So welcome everybody. Um, I hope everyone is having a wonderful summer. Uh, my name is Bernard Wong. I am the Director of Graduate Studies. And um, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone here uh, and to provide some useful information, hopefully, for many of you um, as you start your uh, journey here at the University of Waterloo. Um, so uh, you, some of you might be wondering why our um, the part one of our orientation is happening in late July. It seems pretty early. Part of the reason is that uh, we want you to have the information you need to get a good start uh, with your graduate studies here. But the second reason is that uh, course enrollment actually starts in August. So some of the information that I'll be uh, providing you today will help you make those decisions, make decisions on which courses you want to take uh, and also provide some additional guidance in terms of, you know, your interactions with your supervisor, funding availability and other things like that. So, um, yeah, hopefully it'll be useful. Um, and part two of the orientation, I believe, is going to be happening at the end of August, closer to when you'll be arriving in Waterloo. So um, yeah, so uh, welcome again. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, all of you um, as uh, in, in the fall term and later terms. Okay. So first, I want to introduce you to uh, some of the different um, you know people within the school. 
Um, so first we have Raouf Batapa. He is our top administrator. He's the director of the school. Um, he handles a lot of the school level um, decision making and such. Um, most likely, unless he is your supervisor, you won't be interacting too much directly with him. Um, you know, but um, but someone who you might interact more with is is the second person, which is me, Bernard Wong, uh, director of graduate studies. So I am uh, in charge of uh, the graduate studies program here uh, in the School of Computer Science. Um, and uh, you know, if you have uh, issues with uh, with you know your studies, if there are questions about what you need to do, um, generally you go first through the graduate office. But sometimes you'll be directed directly to talk to me. And I'd be more than happy to help answer some of your questions, maybe provide approvals for certain uh, requests that you might have. OK, the next person is uh, May Nagapon. Uh, he is the associate director of graduate studies. So uh, you might recognize his name because his name should be on some of the offer letters, some of the offer letters that you might have received from the school. Um, as the associate director of graduate studies, he uh, is responsible for uh, admissions. Um, so, um, you know, as you when when you apply to the school, he uh, and uh, the uh, and the graduate committee was involved in uh, you know organizing that and making sure that our faculty members are um, um, receive those uh, applications and uh, can you know accept students and help them through that process. So again, um, you probably won't be interacting too much with May unless he's your supervisor. Uh, the general division of work in the graduate. Uh, off in, a, in the between the director and associate director of graduate studies is that you know before the students arrive uh, generally this is something that may handles so uh, admissions and then after they arrive generally any issues any concerns are handled by me okay so another person uh, that you might uh, uh, want to know is uh, Richard Treffler so he is the MMAF coursework advisor so uh, for um, our research-based students generally you would have then okay, um, uh, a research supervisor, and a lot of your questions will go to your supervisor. For our coursework students, you don't have a research supervisor, so Richard serves as that role. So when you have, if you have questions, more general questions about maybe course selections or maybe how the program works, he's a good resource. He's, he's a good person to talk to. Finally, we have Naomi Nishimura, as well as Richard again, uh, serving as graduate advocates. OK, so as uh, as your advocates, um, what they can help you with is, again, uh, they serve as another avenue, another source of uh, information. Um, a lot of times um, you know, if you have, let's say, some you know, concerns, issues with maybe with your supervisor, you may feel like, you know, talking to your supervisor about it is is challenging. And uh, the, the graduate advocates serve as this intermediary that you can talk to, who you can talk to, and they can um, provide you with advice. They can help uh, resolve some problems. They will often forward uh, some of these questions or concerns to me, and we can try to help assist you with any problems you might have, specifically with maybe your supervisor or concerns you have with the program. Additionally, we have a number of staff members um, so right now we're actually currently slightly understaffed. A few of our um, a few um, members of our graduate office uh, left recently, and we're uh, looking to um, fill their roles. So by the time you arrive in September, um, there's a very good chance that there may be some additional uh, members of our staff in the graduate office. So uh, Denise, uh, she is the graduate studies supervisor. She is essentially in charge of the graduate office. Um, and uh, you know a lot of questions you have may end up going to her. She may be able to help you with those. Paula Rosa, uh, she is our graduate coordinator for financial and TA uh, related items. So um, you know, issues with funding or TA assignments uh, can go to her. Um, and then finally with Nadine, uh, she is the graduate coordinator currently for both PhD and master students. Although most likely by the time um, you start uh, we will have found another uh, member uh, to join our staff who may be taking over uh, one of these um, uh, to, take, to take over as a graduate coordinator for maybe the PhD or master's program. But for now, it's uh, Nadine. And so if you have questions about uh, your program, if you have questions about, you know, course requirements and other, um, you know, um, program uh, related items, uh, you can talk to Nadine um, for for these 
um, questions. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the different types of programs we have. And so um, in the School of Computer Science, our graduate program is broadly broken up into two types. The first are those uh, that are research based. So uh, these are our PhD students, PhD thesis students, as well as our MMAF thesis or research paper option students. Now, I, I suspect all, uh, all of you in the research program are either uh, PhD thesis or MMAF thesis, since we don't accept students directly into our research paper option. Generally, the research paper option is meant as um, is something that you can switch into in, in some specific cases. Um, the most um, the person that you'll most uh, be uh, communicating with the most as a research based student is your supervisor. Um, he or she is uh, the person who admitted you to the program. Um, it, uh, you know, so the, unlike some of uh, some other uh, universities, some other schools, um, instead of having a committee uh, who admits you into the program, uh, your individual supervisor uh, admit you into the program. Um, and uh, so they they looked at your um, they looked at your application. They they uh, very likely uh, had a conversation with you at some point, and they gave you the uh, the offer, right? So um, they they are very familiar with who you are, and now uh, and they might even have a already have a plan as to what you may be working on as uh, as part of your thesis based research. Um, they also provide you with your research assistantship, and so uh, this is essentially funding. Uh, um, to help you, um, you know, with your studies, to pay for tuition. Um, your the, as part of the research assistantship, you will be doing research-related work for your supervisors, for your supervisor, and uh, this is um, um, and this research is meant to go towards your thesis that you will be completing uh, at the end of your program. Uh, they're there to guide you in your research, and they're also there to help you with your course selection. So they are your first point of contact. Um, you, know, uh, you, know, this, you know, this is someone that you'll spend a lot of time with. And uh, so make sure that you know them well, make sure that you, know, uh, you have a good working relationship with them, uh, and you should contact your supervisor as soon as possible. Okay. Now for our coursework based uh, students, okay, so these are our MMAF coursework option. Uh, since uh, your uh, program it consists of only taking courses, you don't have a research supervisor. So as I mentioned earlier, Richard Treffler, it will serve as your uh, as your advisor. Okay, so uh, he can help you with course selection, also answer questions about your program. So feel free to contact him if you have any questions and you're in the coursework option. Okay, so <clears throat> switching gears a little bit, maybe I'm going to talk a little bit about the different courses that are offered here. Um, in the School of Computer Science. Okay. So uh, first, I want to talk about the different course numbering that we have um, at Waterloo. Okay, for those who are maybe coming from a coming from a different uh, university, you're not familiar with uh, how our courses are organized. So we have four different, broadly, with four different types of courses. We have our 100 to 400 level courses, our 600 level courses, 700, and also our 800 level courses. So our 100 to 400 level courses are undergraduate courses. So these are generally not open to graduate students, except as uh, as remedial courses or extra two degree courses. So um, so generally you won't be taking these courses. <clears throat> However, some students, especially those with a non CS background, as part of your offer letter, you might be uh, asked to take some remedial courses to make sure that you have the, the necessary CS background to be able to complete your your graduate research. So uh, some CS some remedial courses may include CS 350, which is our operating systems course, or CS 341, which is our algorithms course. Okay, so so if you are uh, if you have been given a remedial course to take, then you definitely need to take those as soon as possible. Uh, but otherwise, you really shouldn't be taking these courses. You can take them as extra to degree, but they won't count to your towards your degree, uh, degree requirement. And if you do, do plan to take them extra to degree, you should definitely have a discussion with the supervisor before you make that decision, since they can take a lot of time away from your research. Okay. The next um, set of courses are the CS 600 level courses. So these courses, these are graduate courses that are usually held together with 400 level undergraduate courses. So the 400 level undergraduate courses are our senior undergraduate co uh, level courses. And the 600 level courses are essentially the same as those 400 level courses. So same classrooms, same lectures, 
but there's usually some extra work involved for the graduate students. Often this extra work may be extra reading uh, that is given by the instructor. Uh, there may be some extra research related projects that you may have to complete for the instructor. So it depends on the course. Um, and when you take a 600 level course, uh, you will um, you should speak with the instructor and make sure you understand what the 600 level requirements are for this specific course. OK, um, I'll talk more about 600 level courses a little bit later. Generally, my recommendation is that you shouldn't really be taking too many of these 600 level courses. In fact, there is a maximum number you can take depending on which program you're in. Um, they they are not really um, part of the graduate experience, right? They they're mostly a, a, an undergraduate course with some extra content. Uh, we really want you to uh, take, you know, for 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 your degree, most of your degree should uh, consist of the 700 and 800 level courses, which gives you a more complete and kind of more of a broad, um, 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 you know, picture of what graduate studies is like, where 600 level courses is more of an advanced undergraduate course. OK, so then next we have our 700 level courses. So these are standard core um, graduate courses and a number of different subjects and topics. Um, they generally have a fixed curriculum. That means they're often offered um, in, uh, you know, maybe every year um, and the content is more or less the same uh, with each offering, although often they get updated. Uh, 700 level courses are generally lecture based. So um, what this means is that the instructor uh, will generally provide lectures every single class and uh, and uh, you know you learn in that particular way. It's uh, it's very kind of instructor focused in that sense. Uh, in terms of um, um, now, grades for the course, they usually consist of um, assignments, exams, and projects. So for 700 level courses. So in, in a lot of sense, it still has some similarities with maybe some of the undergraduate courses you've taken. It's still very lecture based, but the topics are generally a lot more advanced. Um, so um, so for example, you know, an undergraduate course typically uh, contains content from textbooks and content from textbooks are generally maybe 10 plus years old, right? These are uh, very well understood topics. <clears throat> that um, you know is important, but at the same time, um, you know it's not really the the, you know, the bleeding edge of research. Where 700 level courses often are covering topics that are much more recent, maybe within the last five years or so, five to ten years, um, and it's something that is still often very active uh, areas of research and will help you in uh, your you know in your in, in your in your own research uh, towards your thesis. Right. So these are uh, these are very uh, often very important core courses to take. Okay. And then finally, we have our 800 level courses. These are our research oriented topic courses. Um, in my opinion, most of the courses that you take should be 800 level courses. Generally, um, they consist of reading and analyzing maybe 20 to 40 research papers, uh, depending on the course. Um, so um, instead of being lecture based where, you know, every class you have the instructor providing lectures, uh, often the instructor will give lectures for the first couple of classes to give everyone a general background on a particular research area or topic. But afterwards, um, it's, uh, you know, for many of these courses, students will take turns, uh, you know, giving presentations about some of the papers that are being to analyze in that particular course. So um, as a student in the 800 level course, you will be doing a lot of reading. You'll try you. There's a lot of discussion in these courses where you talk about, you know, what the interesting research contributions are. What are the what are the you know, what are the pros and cons? What are some of the shortcomings? How you can address them? So it's very much, uh, you know, of uh, almost like a stepping stone to the type of research discussion that you would have with your supervisor. OK, um, usually these courses include pro includes a project. Oh, um, I think someone's unmuted. Uh, if you don't mind muting, that would be great. These courses include a project, a research project based on some of the, you know, some of the papers, some of the research topics that were covered in the course. Um, 800 level courses, uh, unlike 700 level courses, can vary offering to offering. So 700 level courses gen generally have a fixed curriculum. 800 level courses are different every time they're being offered. Uh, the topics are basically, um, you know, 
uh, determined by the instructors each time they teach the course. It's based on very recent research topics, uh, based on the you know research interests of the instructor. Um, and because of that, you know, it's actually possible for you to take two offerings of the same course, like the same course number, um, and have them both count towards your degree. Um, because uh, you know, to, even though you took two CS854, which might be a systems course, um, the two different offerings may be very different topics. One may be on um, one may be on serverless computing, the other may be on networking. Right. So these are very different uh, topics. They can both count towards your degree requirement. Uh, of course, um, you know. Uh, on a case by case basis. In some cases, some courses are offered again. Of course, you can't take two offerings that are the same and have them both count towards your degree. Okay, so the different courses that we have um, all have uh, each are given a particular area and uh, each area falls under a particular category. So we have three broad categories of courses those in computing and technology, those in mathematics of computing, and those in applications. And each of these categories have uh, three to five different areas. Now, this is important because um, for your degree requirement, there are some restrictions in terms of what courses you can take and how many courses you can take in an area in a particular area. So let's first look at the uh, master's course requirements. So we're only going to look at thesis and coursework since um, none of you should be in the research paper option uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this particular call. So if you're in the thesis based master's program, uh, you have to take a total of four graduate courses. OK, out of those four courses, at most one can be a 600 level course. OK, and at least one must be an 800 level course okay, for uh, for these to count towards your degree requirement. And then there's also the additional restriction that you can take at most two in a particular area. OK, for coursework students, you have to take a total of eight courses. Okay, and at most three can be a 600 level course and at uh, at least two must be an 800 level course and you can take at more at most four in an area. OK, so the, the reasons why we have these different area requirements and different, um, you know, 600 entry level requirements is to make sure that you take enough courses that are, you know, uh, that broadly covers the different areas that helps you become a very well rounded uh, graduate student. Um, the, uh, again, uh, we don't recommend taking too many 600 level courses because they don't really give you the graduate experience. Really, you should be taking a lot of these 800 level seminar courses where it's more about the, the research uh, topics, the research papers, the discussions. Those are all very important skills that you uh, and also the presentations in those courses are very helpful. These are uh, important skills to develop. Uh, in uh, in uh, in a research base or in in any type of uh, graduate program. Okay, so we do recommend taking uh, uh, you know a number of these 800 level courses. Okay, so you should plan to complete at least two courses per term. Okay, three for uh, coursework uh, students until your course requirements are complete. Okay, this is to make sure that you're making good progress towards your degree. For our thesis based students, um, that this allows you to complete your course requirements within the first two terms and gives you more time to focus on your research after those first two terms. Um, now, this is not a hard requirement. It's uh, it's possible for you to, to, in some cases, take only one course per term as a as a thesis based student. Of course, this requires um, uh, discussion with your supervisor. Your, maybe your supervisor is recommending it because maybe they're offering a course later in the year or maybe they want you to focus on research because uh, research because there's a particular conference or some opportunity that you want to target that um, you know, that may be coming up soon and maybe you, they want you to take uh, fewer courses that particular term that's perfectly okay but of course you need to have a discussion with your supervisor if you're going away from this plan and you should also send me an email um, to confirm um, that your supervisor is uh, in agreement with this plan and this is something that you're planning to do. OK, uh, for uh, our coursework data science students, um, this information is actually not here. It's available in our CS grad web pages. You can check that uh, for more information. I don't think we have our data science students here today, actually. So but in any case, uh, if you're interested in seeing what the requirements are for the data science coursework option, um, you can have a look at the CS grad uh, web pages. For our PhD students, um, it 
uh, the course requirements depend on if you're coming in from a master's um, degree or if you're coming in from a bachelor's. OK, so if you're coming in from a master's degree, then the course requirements is four. You need to take four graduate level courses. Um, at most, one can be a 600 level course and at least one has to be an 800 level course. And if you're coming from a bachelor's, then you need to take eight courses at most. Three can be 600 level courses and at the uh, uh, and at least three needs to be 800 level courses. Okay? As you can see, there are no area requirements here. Um, and the reason is that area requirements for PhD students is uh, handled in a slightly different way. So it's part of what we call the comprehensive one requirements. So this is separate from the course requirements. Uh, it's meant as a way of ensuring that our PhD students have a broad foundation of computer science for uh, for their future research. Okay, we don't. I know some of you are you know really into uh, machine learning or into uh, some type of data science or maybe uh, systems or algorithms, and you only want to take courses in those areas. But you know, from our experience, we find that you know students that only focus in one area very deeply sometimes they don't have the necessary background to really understand and really have a you know uh, really excel and do well later on right because so much of computer science is interdisciplinary and having some uh, knowledge of these other areas at least at a, at a basic level is very important so we do want to um, you know recommend that to our students and we enforce that in uh, uh, using the comprehensive one requirements so the comprehensive one in requirements uh, consists of um, having coverage of six areas and, and these areas have to be at least one from each category. So here's an example of, um, you know, of a, uh, of a correct um, comprehensive one um, plan, okay, one that covers um, the requirements that uh, we set up for the comp one. So in this case, uh, you have a course taken in programming languages and algorithms and complexity, computational statistics, AI, graphics and user interfaces, and bioinformatics, right? So this consists of six separate areas and it spans three different categories. So at least one from each category. So this meets our requirement, okay? Here's an example where you're missing a category, okay? You're, there are six different areas, but you don't have any um, courses taken in an area in computing and technology. This would not be an approved, uh, this would not be uh, 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 an, an approvable plan, okay? If you were to submit this plan to your graduate coordinator, they will come back saying that this is not, this is not okay. This doesn't meet the requirements. Okay, and another one that is incorrect is here where, you're covering all the categories, but there's only five areas here, so that's not sufficient. Okay. So what does it mean to cover an area? So uh, the six courses that you need to take for your comp comprehensive one, um, they cover an area if um, they uh, if you receive at least a B plus, a 78% or equivalent in a course in that particular area. Now these courses can actually be graduate courses or advanced undergraduate courses. So uh, an advanced undergraduate course from Waterloo would be a 400 level course. Uh, it would be something similar uh, in other schools. So this is a course you would typically take in your last year of undergraduate studies. So undergraduate courses at the 300 level or below. So those that are taken before the last year are generally not accepted. OK, so um, for courses from other universities, um, these need to be, uh, of course, evaluated uh, to make sure that they um, meet the requirements. They are in the right area, for example, and they are sufficiently advanced, right? So uh, these courses will be uh, evaluated primarily by me, the graduate director, but sometimes uh, I will get assistance from the graduate committee. So uh, what you need to do is you need to submit a course syllabus, okay, to help me determine whether or not it's in the right area and whether it's eligible, whether it's sufficiently advanced. Right? So when you uh, are submitting your comprehensive one um, plan, you will include the course syllabus for any courses you want to include that are not from uh, Waterloo. Okay, And that will help me make those decisions to make sure that uh, those courses that you've taken, uh, maybe as an undergraduate student or maybe as a master's student somewhere else can be used towards satisfying your comprehensive one requirements. Okay. So 
You should be submitting your comprehensive one report early, so preferably by the end of the first month of your PhD study. So uh, this is it's meant to be a plan, right? So it's uh, it's not about so it doesn't need to be complete. So you can include courses that you plan to take, and you can also update this plan later on. Um, you know, as you make uh, changes in terms of what courses you plan to take. So, uh, so plan your courses carefully so that make so that all of your comp one requirements are satisfied. Okay, this is mainly as uh, a way of ensuring that our students, our PhD students, uh, are on the right path, that they're thinking about the courses they want to take, and they're thinking about how they can cover their comprehensive work requirements very early on. Okay. Right. Uh, speaking of course offerings, um, so as I said, uh, course enrollments uh, start in August, and you can have a look at what courses are uh, available uh, online. So the graduate course offerings should be available online, at least the preliminary list. The full list uh, will be available at when the courses become uh, available for you to enroll in. Um, so in terms of deciding what courses to take, you should consult with your supervisor or your advisor. If, so Richard Treffler, if you're uh, 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 MMAF coursework student, um, and you can talk to them to get their advice in terms of what courses would be helpful in your research and what courses uh, that they recommend for you to take. Um, make sure when you are selecting courses that your course requirements are satisfied, because obviously you need to have all the course requirements satisfied to eventually graduate. Uh, you can enroll in CS grad courses using uh, Quest online, and you can drop courses uh, up to three weeks into the term. OK, so one thing I want to um, highlight here is that you should only enroll in courses that you plan to take. So for example, if you are a thesis based um, MF student or uh, you should be only you should be taking two courses per term until you've completed all your courses. So you should really you should only be enrolled in two courses. OK, I know in the past there's been some students who enroll in three, four or five courses and then try to you know shop around and figure out which courses they want to take and then drop some of these courses, um, you know, in uh, in the second or third week. This is not um, unfortunately this, this this makes it very difficult for uh, for us to make sure that everyone gets to take the courses that they want to take, right? So uh, many courses have a limited number of uh, seats, and if uh, you were to take enroll in more courses than than uh, you plan to take, then some of these courses, especially the popular ones, will get filled up, and others will not be able to take the course. And then later, it's, uh, these courses are and ends up not being full, even though there's a lot of demand for them because people drop out of those courses uh, later on. So we, we definitely don't want this to happen. Uh, you should only take courses. You should only enroll in courses you plan to take. And in fact, if uh, um, the graduate office will go through the, uh, the enrollments and if we find that you've enrolled in more courses than you're supposed to, uh, we will definitely contact you. And in some cases, we will unenroll you in, in, in some of these courses. So we might just randomly unenroll un you in in uh, in one course or two courses or in some cases um, for those who are you know abusing the system we might un unenroll you in all your courses right so um yeah definitely don't want that to happen um you know this helps everybody uh, if you only enroll in courses you plan to take okay but yes uh, course enrollments will start in august um, some of you might be interested in taking non CS courses. Uh, that's that's perfectly OK, although there's there are limits in terms of how many non CS courses you can take um, before you can take a non CS course. You need permission from the instructor of that course and the host department. You also need the recommendation of your supervisor, so you can't just take a course um, without you know, first speaking with your supervisor for the course to count towards your CS degree. Um, it needs to be either on the list of approved non CS courses. So there is a if you go to the course website. So if you go to the, uh, the uh, CS grad studies website, there is a page with a list of approved non CS courses. If you see the, your course there, the, the non CS course you want to take there, then that's something that you can take and it'll count towards your degree. Um, of course, um, it's impossible for us to keep track of all the non CS courses that are being offered. Uh, they change all the time. So some courses you might want to take may not be on the approved list. Um, if you want to take those, you need prior approval from the graduate director from me. 
right? So uh, you should be emailing me um, about your requests. You should include a course outline for the course you want to take um, and whatever other information is available, maybe reference materials, grading basis, and and in and what, what would help me out a lot if it also includes a recommendation from your supervisor, you know, describing why this course would be great for for you to take. OK, so that, those would all be very helpful. Um, you should send those to me and I can give you approval to take that course. And uh, I and I will uh, also specify what area this particular course will belong in. OK. So uh, one of the main things that are, is very important is that any non CS course you take should have CS content. <clears throat> so there are a lot of courses uh, offered at the University of Waterloo that will not receive approval because they are not sufficiently close to CS. They don't have content that would be useful uh, for a CS degree, right? So, so for example, you might be very interested in taking a history course uh, because uh, you know you you like um, you like history, but uh, at the same time, that course may not be relevant to your CS degree. It doesn't have sufficient CS content, and it would not re uh, receive approval uh, to count towards your degree. So just one second, I apologize. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I'm recovering from a cold, so I'm still having a, sm a slight lingering cough. So I apologize if I am uh, coughing a little bit. <laughs> OK, so again, there's a limit in terms of how many uh, non CS courses that you can take. So for an MMAT thesis student, three out of four of your courses must be CS courses for research paper and coursework students. Uh, you can take at most two non CS courses. For a PhD coming from masters, you can take at least uh, at most one non CS course. And from those coming from a bachelor's, you can take at most two non CS courses. Sorry, apologize again. Okay, so switching gears a little bit from courses uh, to uh, funding, uh, one of which is um, would come from teaching assistantships. So teaching assistantships are only guaranteed for our PhD and MMAT visa students. Um, so if you are uh, a math um, coursework student, uh, you won't be guaranteed a TA, um, a TA assistant, like a teaching assistantship. But uh, in some cases, um, we are you know, often still looking for more TAs. You can request to, um, to TA a course if you like, and uh, depending on availability, uh, we may be able to assign a TA to you as a coursework student. So the normal load for a graduate student is four TA units per year. So um, so there are three terms per year. So what this means that with four TA units, um, one of these terms you will be assigned a double TA, so two TA units. Okay, your current assignment, if there are any, uh, is on Odyssey. So you can check Odyssey to see what courses you've been assigned to TA. In terms of the duties as a uh, as a teaching assistant, uh, these are generally set by the instructor or the course coordinator. So for some of our larger <clears throat> undergraduate courses, uh, we have a course coordinator to help uh, coordinate the course, and they usually handle um, you know um, assignments, uh, work assignments to TAs. So you should be contacting them. Uh, you should be contacting them soon, uh, if not uh, immediately. Um, so either the instructor or the course coordinator first just to let them know hey you know um, i'm going to be taking your course i'm looking forward to doing that and also you can <clears throat> contact them to uh, see if they have anything um, if they have any uh, additional information about the type of work that you'll be doing so generally duties involve things like uh, grading um, assignments or grading exams in some cases it might involve um, uh, it might involve uh, providing uh, tutorials to students, or uh, even um, it might involve some um, 
assignment or um, creation right? with, the, with the assistance, of course, of the instructor. OK, so really it depends on the course. You should talk to the instructor of the course or the course coordinator to uh, to see what you will be doing. Oh, I apologize. This cough is uh, it's worse than I ex uh, than I expected. So um, hope, um, I don't think there are too many more slides. Though hopefully I can make it through. So some recommendations about a TA. You should strive to be an exceptional TA. Is uh, it it can be a very rewarding experience. You know, it gives you kind of this first uh, step towards teaching, towards and interacting with these undergraduate students. I know a lot of uh, uh, graduate students really enjoy being a TA. Um, so yeah, um, my recommendation, strive to be an exceptional TA, attend the TA meetings. Being a TA is both a privilege and also a responsibility, okay? Um, you know, if things go poorly, if for whatever reason you're not doing the work that you're assigned uh, or you're, you know, you're not attending meetings, you know, these can uh, cause you to not receive future TA ships and this can lead to reduced funding. OK, so obviously it, it's this is done on a case by case basis. Um, it's something that um, if it's uh, if it's happening with you, we will most likely contact you to have a discussion about this. <laughs> um, but it, it is something that does happen. So. Um, so make sure to, um, you know, uh, work with your instructor uh, for the course to make sure you're uh, meeting all the requirements um, as a TA for that course. Uh, that you're uh, performing all the res your responsibilities and exceptionally performing TAs um, can receive an, a, a TA award. This is great for, for both an item on your CV, uh, you know, later if you're interested in a, a career in teaching, uh, having a TA award can help that quite a bit. There's also a monetary uh, element as well. There's, uh, you know, there's some um, money you can will receive for receiving a TA award. Other funding sources include major scholarships. So, um, so some of the major scholarships that we have uh, come from uh, the Canadian government. So, NSERC, uh, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council, uh, offers a scholarship to uh, Canadian and permanent residents. Um, these are applications that are due in October for PhD students and December for our master's students. These are very prestigious scholarships. Uh, there's quite a lot of extra funding that you will receive. For research, for uh, for getting a NSERC scholarship, and uh, it also reduces the the funding requirement for your supervisor. So this is something that is uh, very, very much something that you should consider if you are a, <laughs> if you are a domestic student. Another scholarship is the OGS scholarship, the Ontario Graduate Scholarship. This is a scholarship that's open to all of our students, including our international students. However, um, the number of uh, scholarships available for international students is very limited. So it is a very competitive uh, scholarship. Applications for the OGS scholarships uh, um, are due in October for international students and February for our domestic students. Okay, again, they're strongly encouraged to apply. <laughs> to apply for these scholarships if you're holding an RA, a research assistantship, and that you're eligible. And eligibility means that you have an average of over 85 percent. Another scholarship that's open to all of our PhD students is the Sheraton Scholarship. Um, so for our PhD students within their program lim limits, uh, with an 80 percent average, you can apply for a Sheraton Scholarship. Uh, three to five scholarships are awarded each term, although that's subject to fund availability. I think for the past few years, it's uh, it's closer to uh, three scholarships rather than five. Um, the Sheraton scholarship is uh, $10,000 per year for two years. In some cases, uh, we've also offered one year scho scholarships for those that are closer to the graduation. Um, so the, um, um, keep an eye out um, for uh, emails about the Sheraton scholarships. Generally, you will receive one um, near the end of each term. Okay? So there's a nomination call for nominations email that's sent out to all of our students. Uh, near the end of each term for the Sheraton scholarship where you would then apply for that scholarship. OK, so um, I understand you know, sometimes, you know. There's a lot of life events 
uh, that's unexpected. You know, you may find yourself running low on funds. OK, you might be asking what to do given that situation. <coughs> first thing you should do is you, just, you should talk to your supervisor. OK, so. They are your first point of contact. They may be able to help you in some way, um, perhaps by providing you more funding or some other means. Um, so this is the, your first point of contact. However, if your supervisor is unable to help, uh, you can also contact the graduate office. Okay, so we do have some funds um, available to help those in genuine, in genuine distress. So um, yeah, um, so don't um, be afraid to contact us to tell us about your situation. Um, I can't promise to be able to help in all situations, but we do have funds available uh, to help when it's uh, it's when it's necessary. So um, so uh, don't feel like you're alone. Uh, there are uh, options available. Let us know if uh, if you're running low on funds, especially those, especially for international students. I understand many of you, you know, this might be your first time in Canada. You know, you may not understand how, you know, some of these, you know, how some things work in Canada and, and maybe, um, the, you know, there may be some financial uh, related issues. Definitely talk to your supervisor in those in those cases and talk to us uh, in the graduate office um, if, uh, if you're in genuine distress. If you have any questions um, about your program, about what courses um, can count towards your degree, uh, about um, things towards your de degree requirement, thesis, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, submission um, forms, other things along those lines, uh, you can contact Nadine or the CS Grad Office for more general in inquiries. <clears throat> if they're not they're, if they're not able to help, you can also send email directly to me. Bernard Wong, uh, if you are uh, a non-coursework student, and if you're a coursework student, you can send email to Richard Treffler, um, and he may be able to help you with your question. And uh, if you have something that's very time sensitive, um, something very urgent, you're, <laughs> you're desperate for some help, you can contact us on MS Teams. You can try to call us. Of course, uh, we're not always available at all times, but we'll try our best to be able to uh, be available to, pro to provide help um, to your time sensitive, time sen sensitive issues or concerns. Okay, um, that's uh, that's it for my presentation. Again, I uh, I want to welcome all of you to uh, to the School of Computer Science. I apologize for my cough. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's worse than I had expected. I I wish I had a bit more water with me, but uh, hopefully you're able to understand most of the content I was trying to get across. I look forward to meeting all of you and welcome again to uh, the school. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bernard. And thank you everyone again for joining. It's time now to leave this um, MS Teams and join your program panel discussion. So thanks again, Bernard, and thank you all for joining us. We will see you soon. Take care.